Timer was the stand-in for Judy. So Timer would come in like with me and come, come here, come here, Rudell, and then just be perfect every single time. And then right before the cameras got set up and the lights, they would say, "Okay, bring Judy in." And poor Timer would just like look around and get swept, uh, <laughs> swept off the stage. She'd be like, "What? Well, I can run circles around this bitch. Wait a second. Simon Bishop, as good as it gets. That was uh, a script by Mark Andrus and Jim Brooks that was, uh, you know, off the charts great. Still to this day, one of the best scripts I ever read. It was called Old Friends. And Jim kept going, no man, I don't like the name. The name's terrible. And I was like, Jim, trust me, the name's great. Um, he was right, I was wrong. Uh, as good as it gets was, um, was a line that Jack utters in the movie. I was shooting another film up in San Francisco and Jim Brooks, and Francine Maisler actually came up to visit me. You know, I read for him, and then I kept just trying to pretend that Jack Nicholson was not in the movie because I was too, <laughs> I was just too big of a fan. It's too crazy to think that I was getting close to doing a movie with Jack, much less when I get the call saying, okay, Greg, uh, we're gonna have you go over to Jack's house tonight and just, you know, read through some scenes. Oh, really? That's it, huh? Just go to Jack's house and read through some scenes. It was terrifying. Her, everything looks distorted and everything inside just kind of aches and you can barely find the will to complain. Yeah. Oh. I'm glad we did this. We shot the movie for a very, very long time and I felt like Jim, who's such a brilliant artist, was just searching for these the sound he he knew it so specifically and i was a huge fan of you know broadcast news and you know terms of endearment he so didn't disappoint me in being the artist that i knew he was and was so great at at bringing you know all of us that whole cast including helen who's off the charts great together and and knowing what we were all there to do he had a he had a thing he was looking for and the more we shot the more it seemed to coalesce Frank Navasky, You've Got Mail. Well, that was with Nora Ephron, the wonderful, talented Nora. I cannot say enough about that woman. Incredible writer and talent and human being. You know, it was kind of based on a writer from the Observer in New York <laughs> that she knew. You know, the guy I was playing in it was, you know, he was a little bit of a nerd. And it was great fun to play because he was, you know, he's definitely the guy that doesn't get the girl. When you got Tom in the movie and Meg, it ain't you know, going my way, you know. You don't love me. <laughs> me either. You don't love me? I really liked Frank. He was a, a lovely little character. And I felt like, um, uh, I was just going to make an observation about something that would have been funny and amusing but I lost it. Oh, hold on. That's giving me time to think about what I was going to do. No, 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 tool around with that for a second. I, it still looks off to me. I think the microphone, look at that. Get on. That's not, I don't feel like that's not going to work. I worked with um, Michael Palin. The great Michael Palin, one of my, my favorite actors dating back to Monty Python days, was also in People don't realize this because he ended up getting cut out of the movie, tragically, because we had great stuff. Michael has had a uh, really funny role in the movie and it just it just didn't pan out in the final story. But uh, one of the great joys of the movie is a bunch of stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor for me. It was my, my work with, uh, with Michael. David Larrabee, Sabrina. Uh, it was the first movie that I ever got cast in. I was basically looking at, at clips of uh, Jerry Springer and uh, Geraldo <laughs> on a show called Talk Soup, and Sidney Pollack, who was an amazing director, producer, and actor, damn, he's good, got a hold of a tape from that show and brought me into his office to talk to him about the role. I just thought he wanted me to uh, you know, come in there because he couldn't believe anybody else was from a smaller town than him in Indiana. He was engaging and interesting and got me relaxed, then told me I'd be playing Harrison Ford's brother, which uh, kind of killed the relaxation part of it. I'm not ready to make this kind of commitment. 
I see. She must have asked for an actual wedding date. I don't know what came over me. She was healing children. I was in a tuxedo. I'm not in any position to take care of a wife. Elizabeth is a doctor and a millionaire, David. She won't be a burden. We read through a few scenes, and, and he had me come back. And eventually, I got a call from my agent asking me if I was sitting down. I believe I was, but uh, he, he told me that I, I, I was going to play this uh, play this role. And it was a tricky movie to do because, obviously, it's a beloved remake. William Holden is, a, you know, a, certainly a beloved actor. My mom was a big fan, and so I was taking on his role. And I kind of felt like this isn't real. The set was very you know, way crazy over the top with always it seemed to be a thousand extras and everybody sipping champagne both when we were rolling and not rolling. It was all quite lovely and uh, it was a hell of a way to start. <laughs> Autofocus, Bob Crane. Bob Crane was a TV star from the from the 70s on a show that I loved called Hogan's Heroes and it turns out <laughs> Uh, Bob had a um, bit of a, what we think is a sexual addiction. Willem Dafoe plays John Carpenter, the man who was suspected ultimately of bludgeoning Bob to death with a camera tripod. And it's it's definitely a tragic story, but it was um, an, an interesting, especially in the current environment and in, in all of its, you know, excesses. Well, word is, Colonel, there's got to be a surprise inspection. I don't know about you guys. There's gonna be an inspection. I got things to hide. I got things to hide. There's gonna be an inspection. It's kind of an outrageous movie, but one of my favorite films. <laughs> my kids are never gonna watch it, but uh, I, I actually really think that the movie is um, profound, and there's no doubt that it, it captures the essence of, of, of a struggle that this guy really had. Richard Hoover, Little Miss Sunshine. Yeah, that was a movie. Sorry, just having a... Um, I don't know what to say about that. Man, that was a good movie. We can skip around. Yeah, we can, we can skip couple, around. Other ones huh? Pick. No, 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 but I like that movie. I'm trying to think of what I do want to talk about. Let's not skip through the... <laughs> it's a hit, for God's sake, so let's keep it on for a second. I'm waxing poetic on a movie that was seen by about 100,000 people. We finally are at Little Miss Sunshine. You want to move on? For God's <laughs> sakes. I don't got that many of these. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what'd you ask about? That movie was a gift. Jonathan Dayton and Valerie F Ferris had not directed a movie before. They'd done a lot of commercial work. This movie had been out there. In fact, a friend of mine, David Friendly, uh, first showed me the script, and I was like, yeah, seems cool, let's do it. And it just couldn't get its funding together. Nobody thought that was a movie to be made, and so a year went by, two years went by. I was a little in touch with uh, John and Valerie, and they were like, yeah, we really want to make the movie because uh, this uh, girl, Abigail Breslin's getting older. <laughs> so Abigail was now, I think, nine, nine and a half when we finally shot it, and she was just so right for that role for obvious reasons. The producer, Mark Turtlebaum, I think originally, I think he just wrote a check for $7 million and that's how we ended up making the movie. But the script was great. It was great. You know, much better than I realized. I, honestly, I read Little Miss Sunshine and I was like, yeah, it's, it's, it's good. Oh, it, seemed, it seemed good, it seemed, seemed smart. And then as we got closer to it and I kind of like, I had a, you know, kind of dove into it again, I was like, oh my gosh, this thing is so, great, like every beat, every nuance, the characters, everything. And I just, I knew it was at first blush good, but I didn't know it was exceptional, but it really was. And I thought, you know, once we got together, we really had something because John and Val wanted to do a thing which no one seems to do anymore in show business uh, called rehearsal. So we all got together in this strange space over in, I don't know, near Culver City. Steve and Tony and Alan, the whole gang. We did weird stuff. It was weird actory stuff. We, we had little uh, diaries and we'd write what the other characters thought about us. We played dodgeball together. I drove us in that yellow van to the valley to go bowling and about killed us for the first time. When we made the movie, I almost killed us another 30 or 40 times. It was the most dangerous movie ever made because we did all our own driving. There was no, we didn't have stunt people. There, nobody could afford that. Come on, honey. I'm putting it in gear. Go, honey. Come on, come on, come on. Woo! Down, let's go. Ah! Frank, let's go. 
if you saw a red or a yellow van screaming down the freeway at about 60 miles an hour with a bunch of cameras in it, it was probably us. Rigsby Bear, Detective Vogel, a very kind of imaginative script. And I had no idea how that movie was going to turn out. And it's a little gem. It's a great little film that captures the spirit of imagination and creativity. What's that in your shirt? It's Brigsby. Of course. Detective uh, Vogel is a closeted actor. <laughs> and uh, he, he actually is helping James, who's a kidnap victim, who's kind of adapting to his new freedom in, in making a movie. He, he wants to make a movie called Brigsby Bear based upon the movie that is a psychotic captor, played by Mark Hamill, actually showed him repeatedly when he was a child. I hope this is all making perfect sense to you at home who haven't seen the movie, <laughs> because I can't explain it any clearer than that. But it's a great movie. That's all I can tell you. Dr. David Ravel. Nurse Betty was a uh, wonderful script. Um, in fact, it won the Golden Globe, I believe, that year. I was playing a soap opera star opposite Renee Zellweger. She has a, develops a, a, a strange kind of otherworldly crush on me and believes that I'm a real doctor. <laughs> Chris Rock, Morgan Freeman, also in the movie, directed by Neil LeBute. It, it's a really, really good movie, w one of my favorites. And I remember them really having trouble with it. I remember watching an early cut of Nurse Betty and saying, well, that sucks because it just didn't work. And they finally, they found it though, and they, through a lot of work and effort, I think they, and it shows you what can happen editorially. And I also remember, uh, because I worked again with Renee not too long ago, and we were recounting the fact that I kind of lost it. It's the only movie I've ever done in my life where I, I literally just lost it. We had a scene where she's in a little nurse's outfit, and we're in a diner, and I'm Dr. David Ravel, and I say something, and we're on a soap opera now. There's always a chance, David. But what about tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day? We just lost it. We lost it completely. I've never laughed so hard. And it was funny at first. And as the time went by, you know, you're kind of looking at the crew, kind of like people are looking around. And Renee and I are recognizing that it's kind of past its expiration point now and we really just need to shoot the goddamn thing. I ended up with a C stand with a tennis ball on it representing Renee Zellweger saying, Cherry, your eyes look like moonbeams or whatever the hell the line was. And she did the same for me. That's the only way we could complete the scene. We're both mortified by it to this day, but hey man, show business. Bill Shepard, House of Cards. Great thrill to do it in, in the sense that it's just an iconic show and it deserves to have a final season, which was close to not happening. Credit to Robin Wright for kind of keeping the train on the tracks. Also, the writers being able to retool this. And I think uh, MRC and Netflix, you know, for taking care of the crew. I mean, this is an incredible crew. You, you watch that show and, and uh, yeah, the actors are front and center, but there are so many professionals behind the camera making it look seamless and incredible. And it was great fun to do it. I, I've always been a fan of Diane Lane's. The idea that she would be my sister and partner in evil seemed great. We do have kind of a Bob Hope Doris Day thing going on, so to actually flip that upside down and make us formidable enemies trying to destroy Claire's life was, uh, I think, uh, pretty effective. It was great fun to, to do. I mean, they, they really know how to create chaos, even more than what's happening in Washington on uh, House of Cards. It's pretty good stuff. You know, it's, it's a hard question, you know, what you look for in a character because I'm not looking for anything. When I read a script, it kind of needs to find me, I feel like. It's like I, I never thought of a guy capable of doing that or having that agenda. This is all, the writers are great at this, but I find that it usually is not my search to find something. It's, it's reading something and being surprised. As time goes on, it gets harder and harder, I think, to get surprised. But they're still out there, and it's still, um, it's still as exciting as hell when you, when you find something where you're like, oh, that would be fun.